myself, uh, my name is Dennis, I work at Oracle. Uh, my main job is with development and also I play a role of uh, developers at the gate of Oracle. Specifically, I'm promoting and trying to get people involved in the platform we've been developing. But I'm going to talk a bit about it a bit later. So today we're going to talk about <coughs> serverless thing. Have you uh, been uh, known with this type of technologies? Uh, have you tried that? in any cloud platforms. Okay. So, as far as you know, there are so many different technologies. So, um, in a few years ago, we started talking about a factor thing that uh, helped us to uh, shift the technologies from the monolithic applications into microservices, which are we, we've used uh, for uh, all the different uh, types of workloads. Okay. So, uh, Monolithics, microservices, so what, what's next? And the next thing is a uh, serverless. Uh, this is probably my favorite quote about the serverless. Uh, so yeah, this, there are still, there are still have to be someone to run servers in order to run the service. But still, you don't have to worry about the infrastructure itself. And you just uh, delegate uh, any responsibility you want to delegate into the cloud provider or any of the uh, platforms you want to use. Uh, so, what's the serverless architecture problem? And the answer is, it's none of this. Uh, we didn't, we're not talking about the master slave, we didn't talk about the filter, filtering, we didn't talk about uh, broker, the client broker, or client server applications. We just talk about the, uh, delegating the code execution into a different infrastructure. Uh, so, what the serverless can be? Uh, you, probably you must be familiar with the paradigm of mapper use. So, you can do mapper use, but with serverless. And every uh, point of compute, uh, computing here can be a fun serverless function. Also, it can be a serverless tensor. Uh, you can uh, implement in any uh, map, uh, map operations as a function and do a continuous data processing in those tensors. Um, also, it could be a uh, FIFO, FILO, or any other stack based uh, data processing uh, pipelines. Uh, but like, if you, if you do that uh, locally with uh, any loop or iteration, you can also do the same with service. But you're going to call a service function, but not your local code. So, uh, here's who we are. Uh, we call ourselves a event project. It's an open source, like completely uh, serverless platform that gives you a powerful to develop uh, a serverless function with any type of programming languages you would like to use. So basically, there are no limitations in order to, uh, in terms of the uh, technology adoption. Um, so, what, what is the event? It's an open source, it's container native, it's developer oriented because we're developers, we're trying to get a developer experience onto a new level. Uh, and also, as I told you, it's completely runtime agnostic. So, you can use Python, you can use Java, Node, uh, or whatever programming language you would like to use, since it's container native. So, whatever you want to put in container, it can be a function. This is what we started uh, with. The MDKs is function development kits. Basically, is the, the, those are a set of libraries for different languages in order to uh, focus the development on, to, on functions, but not on the interaction protocol between the event platform and uh, basically <coughs> container. So the MDKs, uh, you would not probably gonna use the MDK in order to uh, make the uh, development simpler in order to hide a uh, protocol interaction. So yeah, let's just stop talking and do some fun thing. Yeah, yeah I know that everybody loves memes. I just see a lot of different things. So today I'm gonna show you on the example how serverless can, add, can help you to build a pipeline, data processing pipeline using different type of technology. In this particular case, we're going to use uh, Golang and Python as base programming languages. Also, we're going to use a TensorFlow uh, with data object detection, uh, OpenCV for uh, for uh, images processing, in FFmpeg in order to use its uh, capabilities to uh, work with video files. 
So what's the demo consists of? It consists of uh, at least five functions. Uh, one function takes your video and then disassembles it into a set of frames based on the frames per second. Uh, then they use a tensor flow, a tensor flow in order to detect objects on each frame of video. Uh, and then they will put a log of a kind of logo over here, as you can see. Uh, it also uses uh, the next function uh, it takes uh, a chunk of frames and then assembles one second video. And then uh, there is another function that assembles all chunks of one second. So basically it tries to assemble that the whole video. And it sounds clean. So probably the good question from you would be, hey, I can do all of this thing uh, on the one machine, on the one Python script. So basically, it's true. However, if you've been using a lot of uh, OpenCV or TensorFlow, you might be aware that it's not really the same. So, yeah, I see, I see you I see you're disagreeing with me, but yeah. A video processing, image processing in OpenCV is not really the same. Uh, basically, not in Python code, it's on the CD system. So this is what the demo looks like. Uh, have you ever used Minio? It's an open source implementation of Amazon S3 Storm. Uh, and there is also one part that runs as a daemon. Uh, it's called uh, Minio S3 Poster Bot. It's written particularly for this demo. And also, there is an event that runs uh, a bunch of so this is how uh, the demo uh, structure. Uh, when the user uploads a video, it starts a frame splitter. So basically, that uh, assembles your video into, onto the frames. It starts a function that call, uh, it's a, called a recursive function. It calls itself, but it's a serverless recursive function. Well, of course, without any tail recursion. So you basically, your function keeps calling itself in order to keep running. Uh, the, another triggered function from the frame splitter would be an object detection. Uh, it's written with Python. It uses the TensorFlow and OpenCV in order to do image processing and object recognition, plus within frames, uh, text, etc. Uh, and then it starts a, a segment assembler since the object detection function accepts uh, a chunk of images based on the frames per second. So it basically it can be uh, a 24, set, uh, 24 images or up to 120 frames per uh, images based on the frame per second. Uh, the daemon, uh, daemon bot, uh, bucket daemon function starts a segments assembly because the daemon, uh, bucket daemon actually listens on a temporary bucket that was created by uh, a frame splitter in order to meet the pattern. So basically it will await for every, uh, will await for a particular number of uh, video files in a separate bucket, where they, each file represents a one second video. Uh, and then we'll just assemble them using the, uh, the OpenCV, and then we'll put uh, the uh, in your uh, newly assembled video onto, onto the original bucket, and then we'll delete every temporary file created for this demo. Okay, this is how we look the structure demo. So every uh, arrow displays here the interruption. So you can, see, as I already told, there is a flame splitter that acts like an entry point to our application. It triggers a two function that basically that. And each of those triggers their own function. Uh, so this, this is like a circular chart that helps you to understand how many functions you would get if you would run a, uh, this demo with a video that uh, has a, a 46 frames, uh, 46 seconds long. So you can see like it will start a 46 watch detection, it will start a 46 segment assemblers, uh, it will start a frame once frame splitter and continuous bucket demon because uh, we can know for how long it would, would take to uh, do an object detection and uh, to do uh, um, sound for, uh, for the whole video. Um, and the, probably the beauty of the serverless thing here is that you can run all of this demo under the small onion and negative chip, which costs like $5. It's a small IoT chip. You can put the, uh, the, uh, the whole application there and it will run. Just uh, This chip has only 46 megabytes of RAM and 16 megabytes of storage. So basically, it's kind of very 
uh, valuable thing for several is because uh, if you are familiar, there is a, a, a concept technology which is called uh, edge computing or fog computing. When you have uh, a, a huge uh, computation resources placed in close to your IoT chips in one hub, in order to build a uh, the fastest data processing. And the first implementation of this for computing or edge computing is Tesla car because it has a lot of uh, GPUs on board. It has a lot of uh, detector, uh, detectors that help you to recognize, uh, to process the raw <coughs> situation in real time. Um, so how this uh, scaling model works with uh, a fan? So we have uh, two different types of uh, scaling models. We have a cold model and a hot model. Cold model actually will start a function. As soon as your function completes your execution, it dies. However, uh, in order to bring a certain uh, uh, performance for uh, function develop uh, developers, uh, we've made a hot mode. So basically, your function will keep running as long as you have there is more data to process. And it will scale and it will start a new function as soon as your first request got, got delayed onto the 300 milliseconds. So basically, if you're gonna process like a, a 1,000 requests per second, it will start like say six different functions, and then will, it will distribute your requests onto those functions in order to get away from the many delays in our processing. So basically, this is how the concurrency works in, uh, in a, for, example, for instance, in Golang. So basically, you have a bunch of the uh, smaller programs you need to distribute them uh, within multiple cores. So in this terms, a core is a function. And uh, you can start as many functions as your workload, uh, depending on, on the size of your workload. So this is how you can start working with the event and Python specifically. So uh, by default, the event supports only Python 3.6 because 2020 is pretty close and we want to work with Python 2.7. Uh, because uh, there is one particular re reason uh, that uh, I'm going to show you in a, in a minute. So this is how, this is what the world, what kind of a boilerplate you're going to get generated for uh, your function. So basically, it's an, it's an echo function. Uh, you're gonna write this, you can, you can, you, uh, and this function will just say, like, hello John, hello Dan, and etc. Uh, and this is the particular reason why uh, we did not support Python 2 7, because uh, the FDK nearly supports Coropians, and there is no uh, clear way to uh, make uh, the FDK support uh, Coropians not in a different way. And uh, as far as you know, like Python 3.6 uh, has a better concurrency model than 2.7 because it's already built in. And uh, like the great minds made the concurrency framework available for all. It's still simple, simpler than if you're going to develop application with any of C or C++. However, it still has certain problems, but we're not talking about those in this one. Um, this is some kind of special thing we made for Python developers. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Pickle Protocol? Okay. So, uh, as far as as far as you know, the Pickle Protocol helps you to serialize and deserialize executable objects in Python. So you basically can create a function or a class, and then create a byte representation, which is the pickle itself, and then you can send the pickle over the wire to uh, any execution platform, and then run that executable deserialized code on the uh, on another infrastructure. There was a product called uh, Cloud Pickle, if you heard about that. They've been developing a platform where you can uh, uh, delegate your Python code specifically onto their platform. So it was like the first steps towards the uh, serverless platforms, but they did not succeed. Yeah, so this is how Pickle <laughs> works here. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, let's just stop on this one, and then we'll go to a demo. Let me just keep my hand on
we're back on launch. Okay, um, just work this. Okay, uh, it doesn't matter what I'm showing at this moment, it's a Minio dashboard I.O., so basically it's an entry point to a Minio application. Um, so let's do the next thing. Uh, I need to start my demo here. Um, okay. Okay, so as you can see, uh, there's a bucket called uh, Py uh, Attack. It's just uh, for, for the demo. So I'm gonna upload a file to this bucket. So I have a prepared a uh, small video here. Uh, it's a video of a forecast, uh, it's a snow forecast from New York uh, this winter. So I just need to wait until the demo will actually start. So, so as, as you can see, the video was uploaded here. If I'm going to refresh a refresh uh, web page, uh, I'm going to have a new bucket created. So as you can see, it has a bunch of uh, images, and each image has an index of its frame uh, inside the video. So just there are so many of those. Uh, so we just need to wait until it finishes and just they just update the. Uh, Let's just go to the fan UI. So is it uh, probably not the best color here? Uh, so as you can see, uh, there is a chart that shows the running functions at this moment. Uh, so it has a bunch of functions started. So the biggest one is the object detection because we need to process uh, 46 uh, Object detection, watch object detections, and also there is a uh, one uh, one function that works as a frame splitter, uh, the one function that works uh, that works as a bucket daemon that pulls uh, the temporary bucket I showed you just a few seconds before. So okay, let's go back to. Okay, so the basically demo is finished. Uh, it, it's the beauty of this that everything happens uh, on, uh, asynchronously, and uh, you basically have a zero control. But in this case, it's a fault tolerant, uh, uh, fault, -tol fault tolerant execution here. So uh, let me show you the original video here, and then I will show you uh, what kind of uh, things you can do with servers. So basically, I'm going to show you the code that I used to uh, develop this demo. So basically it's a Times Square during the snowfall. So you can see like there are so many people doing their jobs, uh, some cars. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's a pretty short video as I've told you, it's 46 seconds and you can just scroll it through. Okay, let's go back to our uh, UI. Let's just download the original video. So basically, as you can see, the bucket, of the temporary bucket is done. Uh, we have a new video appearing here. Just wait until. Okay. okay. So this is how it looks at this moment. Uh, the one problem here that uh, the. Uh, an FFmpeg is that doesn't handle well the um, ABC1 codec. So basically, you can see it just uh, the, the video doesn't look similar to original, but it does a detection. It's not just a, a sequence of frames, and also it doesn't have sound because the OpenCV can't process sound. And I decided just to avoid this particular point. So as you can see, it runs <coughs> whenever it can detect. It uses the uh, Coco2 uh, detection model, which has, as far as I remember, 90 uh, uh, objects, uh, the 90 classifiers here. So yeah, this is what it happens. So basically, you can see uh, we've put a demo, put here a logo, a fan logo here. 
uh, using the pillow, and it also puts uh, a frame and the text using the OpenCV. I use pillow because uh, it's simpler to merge videos with pillow uh, comparing to merging two videos with the uh, OpenCV. Okay, this is how it how it worked. Uh, so now let's go back to to our to the code. So uh, I'm gonna put the links to the repository I've been using. I'm gonna enlarge this in a second. Uh, let's start with the. Uh, So yeah, I know, <laughs> it's not a Python, it's going. So uh, this is my next statement would be, that the serverless makes you decide which technology solves the problem in the most efficient way. So uh, the Golang helps you to build a better concurrency model than Python has, even with the corrodings. If you're gonna run a simple example, if you're gonna just create the two corrodings and then run them as getter task, uh, you will see that the same code written in Go will run at least twice faster. But it's like it's not the news to those of you who've been using Go for development. Um, so this is how the demo works. Um, so as you can see, that the our application didn't trigger a new object detection on the uh, uploaded video, the later uploaded, because it was like a test demo. So if the object has a test prefix, it just ignores the whole thing. Um, so uh, we we connect to the to the uh, S3. We upload. We get a video from there. We put it onto the file system, on the temporary directory, and then do a do a detection. So uh, all of this demo, uh, all of this function was written with Go CV. It's an uh, open source project to uh, try to uh, try to be at the same product as OpenCV for Python. But it's just a wrapper on top of the uh, C++ C library, uh, open C library. So it actually works faster, uh, but but still has the same problems as open C for Python. You can't run that inside the inside the corrodings. You can't run that inside threads because if you're gonna use the same, uh, uh, if you're gonna call uh, the same function, for instance, the uh, video capture function from the open CV is not really safe. It's gonna write you uh, an error. It will return you an error or write the uh, handled exception. So uh, let me show you quick the object detection functions. Okay. So the fun thing here that uh, everybody can see clearly It's okay. So um, the one thing here is that you have to upload your graph into a memory. So basically, you need to initialize the upload, and before you start your uh, function, before you start your function, because you would need to have only one instance of the graph during the whole uh, function execution. And since this object detection function is uh, a <coughs> function. It will keep running your uh, graph until there is more images to process. So basically, the function will, will uh, the append will create more than, uh, for instance, five instances of this, this function. And then it will, it will distribute the 46 uh, chunk detections to those functions. So yeah, it, it's basically it's, uh, a simple function. You upload the uh, you upload the graph. You initialize the session, you run the object detection, then do uh, get the classifiers, get the dimensions, put the text, put the logo, done. And, um, and probably the last one here. Oh, yeah, in the video assembly. One second of video assembly here. So basically, what we do, uh, we accept a, a request, uh, we try to get a video from. Uh, uh, we get we get images from the previous function. What we we do, we decide which codec we would like to use in order to build a video. So basically, the initial uh, uh, frame splitter function knows the original codec of the video. 
and it sends it uh, send the codec to every any other function in order to let them know or bypass the codec to a next next step function. So uh, this function takes images, uh, it assembles a video, and then tr and then uh, just uploads the video back to um, to S3 store. Um, so there is one a good thing about the S3 and the, any of these implementation and that you allows you to create a pre-signed URLs. So basically you don't have to bypass your user uh, user and password to every function. You, you can just create a bunch of pre-signed URLs for one hour, one minute, or like forever. And then we, you can just say like, uh, I'm, I'm going to create uh, a webhook uh, to this uh, object with HTTP get, put, or delete. So the, and basically uh, the only function that needs to get an authorization is the frame splitter function because it has to uh, has the credentials needed to create buckets things that uh, S3 doesn't have an API uh, the uh, signed API to create buckets without getting authorized because of the original policies yeah, you, you, you might know about that if you've been using S3 for, for a while um, yeah so let's go back let's go back to our presentation here. So yeah, as I already told, the serverless actually makes you decide which technology solves the problem in the most efficient way. And this is probably the best example I found, found while I was developing this demo. Uh, we, we have an OpenCV Python, and the beauty of that is you can use the uh, NumPy arrays because you probably need to you would like to use any other feature uh, from uh, TensorFlow or any other framework that actually uses the base the, the NumPy arrays as the base base type of process. But if you're familiar, the NumPy arrays are not the ba base type in OpenCV C library, but it's only about Python thing. Just just makes a wrapper on top of the library, which which makes you. Uh, work simpler with your code. And the, the second logo is the Go CV application. Basically, if you've been developing Go, you, you probably know that you can write a Go a C library wrapper just in a few lines of code. So uh, I'm the one of the contributors of, the, of this project, and uh, we, we found out that the, the Go CV actually solves the problems faster. So basically, if you have the same core technology with the C Open CV library, it just in the serverless in the serverless thing, it's all, it, it becomes a matter of the most efficient wrapper. So basically, you compare Go to Python, which one are efficient? Probably you can answer it to yourself. But for me, uh, the Go sometimes appears to be more uh, faster. But still misses a lot of features for data processing because the goal of the goal was not designed initially to uh, do the thing <coughs> as Python was designed for. Um, and this is the one fun thing I found out. So, uh, have you seen how many requests you can find out on Stack Overflow about the face detection, uh, eye detection, TensorFlow, uh, object detection? There are millions of requests. So basically, if you're good at machine learning, if you are good at uh, any uh, deep learning uh, data processing, make functions, share them as a knowledge. So basically, if you know someone who has like a basic knowledge in data in data processing, and I bet there are so many developers who know how, who knows how to write efficient code, but they are not uh, analysis. They didn't know how to uh, develop models. Basically, they didn't know math. Uh, so, if you know, if you're good at something, put it inside a function because you're gonna share a predictable, a reproducible environment here. So, basically, because uh, I've seen a lot of requests on the Stack Overflow or uh, or Quora that people say like, uh, "Hey, I took your script, I tried to launch it, and it doesn't work." So, are you trying to be a uh, you're trying to guess what went wrong, what kind of operating system you use, are you on Windows, are you on Mac or Linux, or what kind of flavor of Linux you use. It still matters, because uh, if you've been developing with TensorFlow, no matter would it, would it be Python or uh, C++ or Golang, 
you might find out that it doesn't work well on the Alpine Linux because of the original problem with GCLE. Um, so yeah, shared knowledge is your own responsibility. If you're good at it, share it. This is what the community is all about. Um, so I guess the deep, uh, key takeaway here is that the technology adoption is no longer a concern for serverless because you can use any type of uh, programming languages, you can use any type of technology you can put, since you can put it inside a container. So it just matters of the, how, how efficient your development is. So any granularity means better scaling. So if I, uh, as I show you here, uh, you can do a function that takes a video and then splits to the frames. Just replace the term video and frames and then just define what's your complex data is and what your granular, granular what's your minimum unit is here. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, and the functions doesn't have limits except one thing uh, and we're kind of working on that is a GPUs. So probably if you heard about the other talks that the GPU is does doesn't work well on Docker or, or any other container uh, uh, orchestration engine. But still, the um, Mesos, uh, NVIDIA, AMD, they're working hard in order to bring a solid experience for, do for Docker containers in order to bypass the access to the GPU uh, resources from the container. Since the container is, is a different thing to virtual machines, they have more uh, access rights to your kernel and your hard hardware, uh, your hardware. And yet, the key thing about the serverless is the delegated workloads, since you can develop a function and put it onto the, any um, serverless uh, platform. Would it be uh, Google? Would it be Amazon, Azure, or uh, IBM, or Whisk, or, with, or whatever or your own technology? So the key thing is to delegate the workload make your entry point to your application thing. So, in this particular demo I've shown you, there is a thing, uh, access point, which you represent as an S3 poster. So basically it's an application that pulls the uh, S3 8. And these are the kind of useful links. Uh, Medium blogs, my own personal, and uh, our uh, shared the event project. A uh, link to FM project organization GitHub where you can find the FM itself, FDKs, and uh, also Katakoda examples here. Uh, have you familiar with that Katakoda? Uh, it's an, uh, it's an uh, interactive lessons, uh, so you, you can tweak uh, and work with. You can learn technology not just uh, listening to lectures. You can actually get a hack into the sub console and then play with any technologies, whether it be Docker, Kubernetes, or any other technology that uh, the Kenakoda contributors created for. Questions? <coughs> yeah, sure. What the downside of the serverless approach? Uh, what the downside? Uh, so, how does it be fast? Or what? How does it be fast? Or get more time to do that? Uh, so, uh, the, the first downside is a cold start. Uh, if you heard about the, the other talks, uh, the, the serverless actually, uh, in order to start for your function the first time, it, it takes some time, especially if you're uh, loading any, uh, let's say, a data model from external resource. You, you just need to make your function hot in order to keep it running, in order to get away from the cold start again. So uh, the other downside is uh, proprietary development. For instance, if you run your own uh, like organization, you didn't run, you, uh, you didn't do an open source. So basically, you would need to run your own, uh, let's say, pipeline. Uh, pi uh, you need to run your own uh, uh, any, let's say, uh, artifacts uh, repository to where to put your code. So basically, code sharing between functions becomes kind of critical. So uh, it, it kind of depends on what kind of uh, programming languages you use. So there are there are some problems, especially with uh, with Python, with its uh, cache dependencies, with X, wills, What are the standard? Would you run the uh, where your own warehouse, or are you gonna use uh, an older PyPy? Uh, 
uh, repositories, and etc. And they also the, the matters for like from program languages like Java, like Golang, where you have to host your own uh, artifact repository. Um, the downside is GPUs as well, because uh, like for data, uh, we try to build a solid experience for uh, uh, for uh, data processing for machine learning. And the ma main takeaway here is that the GPU is critical for uh, like teaching your models. However, you can run on the on the CPUs, but the functions you know, are not about training models. It's more about using. Then package into a function, basically a container, and then just set it and run this. So the overhead here is um, the first overhead is in time, uh, because the, as far as you know, probably the Docker takes uh, 300 milliseconds to start your container, plus the time your function, uh, your runtime initialization. Basically, how fast my Python starts, how fast your code gets started with Python. This is the overhead on time. Uh, the other overheads, uh, I'm not kind of familiar with any other overheads in the, in the execution. So it, it's pretty fast. It has two different uh, models. You can run your function synchronously or asynchronously. So basically, you have a sort of time limits on the execution of your function. Functions are not designed to be a long running task. So basically, if you need a long running task, just use cron and any other uh, like uh, any other container technology just to run your long run demons or whatever. But the functions are about like fast uh, ad hoc uh, computing resources. Uh, you can allocate whatever uh, any number of uh, CPUs, any number of uh, lab for your particular function to make your function run fast. Uh, so as far as you if you can use TensorFlow, probably probably not. It requires significant amount of memory in order to initialize the block and create a session. So basically, every function that runs on top of uh, which uses the TensorFlow it requires at least one gigabyte of memory. Because without that, your functional just uh, dies with the additional Utilizing the system server mode, like AWS? No, no, no it just pure, just run stuff, Docker, Docker. So, yeah, uh, probably the other question I've been always asked about how you uh, compare yourself to Amazon, to Google. So, um, first of all, if you're going to talk about open source projects, so how you can compete uh, the, run, uh, the managed service against open source projects. So, yeah. So, uh, I think. Uh, the one day Oracle will deliver the, uh, the fan as part of their uh, U Cloud uh, initiative. They probably uh, just follow the announcement. Probably uh, Java Open World in October in San Francisco uh, will be. We'll, we'll give you more highlights. So we don't know how how fast it's going to be as part of the platform. But still, the Oracle considers a fan as direct competitor to Lambdas. But but still. Uh, what why people buy you know, why people buy you know, Amazon, Google, etc. is the integration between services. So basically, you, you don't want to use uh, just Lambdas uh, separately, S3 separately. You you like the integration itself. So this is why people love that. So I think we will have the same integration here uh, for among any other or all cloud uh, projects. But uh, you still have to be aware there is a case studies about running uh, serverless in Amazon. Uh, so you're basically going to be charged with significant amount of cash because Amazon <coughs> pays the price for the networking. So the compute is cheap, the RAM is cheap, the store is cheap, but the networking is damn expensive. So basically, there is a case study uh, when people run the, the monolithic application on the virtual machine, uh, they pay like the 
$2.5,000 per month, and then, then they switch to serverless. They start paying like 50 bucks per month because of the scaling model. And then just every year application becomes ad hoc scale, ad hoc commuting. Um, but still, if you do a lot of networking, like if you're gonna, you just need to upload a huge video and then process it, distribute it into the frames, and runs it on Amazon, uh, on the store that on the S3, you're gonna be charged for like more money. It just matters of the of the number of gigabytes per second. It's, it's pretty expensive. So. so we're not this, uh, the technology called several super. We're not that. Which runs just on top of that. <coughs> okay, thank you.